Hi, I'm Bob Corrigan. I'm the product manager for the Encyclopedia of Life. It was born of a wish by E.O. Wilson back in 2007. The Encyclopedia of Life is an idea that's been around for a long time, and it really took hold a few years ago, I think in part because the technology was ready, but in part because of a TED wish. Um, E.O. Wilson is a remarkable human being and has written extensively on biodiversity. And when that wish was given, there were people in the room who were able to hear that wish and come together and answer it. The goal of the encyclopedia is to bring together information from everywhere, to bring together databases, expert knowledge, and bring information from folks like you to enhance our knowledge of the world around us. And as we've worked on the Encyclopedia of Life, we've come to appreciate something pretty uh, challenging. There's a problem with names. The problem with names is that without them, our understanding of the world around us falls apart. But with them, we're still in trouble. Because names are imprecise. And without context, um, they don't have a lot of meaning. So I'm going to set some foundational knowledge for you, and then we'll build on that. We'll broaden the aperture a couple times. And at the end of this talk, I have a wish that I'd like to share with you. So when we're born, we get a name. Those of you who are parents like me have had the joy and challenge of picking a name. Um, I got my father's name. So I've had a real appreciation for the ambiguity of names since I've been a little kid. Um, I've been Bobby, little Bobby. I'm not that little anymore, but to my mom, I'm still little Bobby. Um, Bob Jr. And that's all great, and it worked within the context of our family. Outside of that, however, um, the curse started, because there are an awful lot of Bobs. There are a lot of Bobs. In fact, Bob, Robert, is the fourth most common male name in the United States. And if the lights were up and I asked you to hold up your hands, I'm betting there would be anywhere from four to six total Bobs in this room. There are five million of us. That's a lot of Bobs. <laughs> Bob Power. Um, so, with all those Bobs, if you were to go home and say, I heard Bob talk at TED, you'd get a blank stare. Even if you said, I heard Bob Corrigan talk at TED, odds are very strong you'd get a blank stare. So you have to add context to that name. And you'd say something, you know, blue suit, big head. Um, <laughs> and you'd rattle off verbatim all the information in the uh, brochure today, which would be lovely. And that would give context to this name. There are 200 or so Robert Corrigans, but only one here today. With names and context, we're able to describe ourselves and others and the world around us, and that gives meaning to those things. But without names and context, we're strangers, even if we're Bobs. Now let's broaden the aperture. There are, and this number may surprise you, about 1.9 million accepted, published, and known species. You may have thought that number was a lot bigger. 1.9 million. About a million of those are insects. That's a lot of insects. <laughs> now, there are still more species being discovered every day, but more often they're discovered sitting in a jar in a museum, or they're discovered as a variation of, uh, of something pulled out of a rainforest. Uh, it's estimated there are many, many more species left to be discovered, but we've got 1.9 million. The challenge is we've got 10 times as many names. So I'm going to share with you some of the challenges we've faced trying to make sense of all this information coming in so that when you come to the Encyclopedia of Life and you type in a name, whatever that name happens to be, we're able to bring you one piece of useful information. My daughter, when she saw these slides, because I tell her all these slides. She's my uh, kind of quality control. I said, oh, I know a joke about a grasshopper, Dad. I said, oh, don't make me tell a joke. Tell the joke, Dad. <laughs> so grasshopper hops into a bar. The bartender looks down and said, hey, I've got a drink named after you. And the grasshopper says, you've got a drink named Steve? <laughs> Best joke ever. <laughs> um, grasshoppers, if you saw a grasshopper, 
and we're relatively grasshopper hip. You recognize it as a grasshopper. It's a really cool looking insect. But there are thousands of species of grasshopper. So when you say grasshopper, it's kind of an indeterminate thing. It's like conversations or traffic. Still, you know what a grasshopper is. And if you know a little bit more about what grasshoppers like to eat, if you know about their habitat, you know their different phases, you've got some meaning associated with grasshopper. You may not know its species name, its, uh, its official scientific name, but you're getting closer. It, when we're trying to put all this information together, we not only have the challenge of, of these kind of conceptual names, but we've got challenges with the scientific names. We're bringing in information from so many different places that we can't do all of this by hand. We rely on the magic of computers to do it for us. And that introduces some problems, such as spelling. This is all, these are all the different ways that you can spell one particularly elegant looking black beetle. And they all show up in the literature. They're all the same thing. Don't look the same, do they? So there are thousands of these lexical groups, thousands of these ways of having this different spellings of the same thing. We've got to make sense of it. Uh, another thing that we are challenged with is sometimes the very same creature will have dramatically different names. There's one red-tailed spotted newt of North America that uh, I've been told about that has 15 different names. Each of those names has separate data published on it. We've got to make sense of all of that. So if you type in any of those names, it's a good name, perfectly good name. But we need to get you the right information on it and present it to you in a way that you can understand. Now, here's this slide that I, um, I know is going to baffle you. There's a fish. Um, there's a part of the United States named after it. It has 125 common names in English. They're all good. If you know the name of cod, in fact, way down there in the bottom left, tossed, the next speaker said, yeah, that's what I used to call it growing up. We called it poor man's lobster. Put enough butter on it, tastes great. <laughs> if you come to the Encyclopedia of Life and look under common names, you'll see all the different ways that people refer to different species. They're all good, but they need context in order to have meaning. And sometimes the names themselves, that context is your only clue in the literature to what somebody's talking about. If you were to talk to a scientist about Aotus, you'd need some context because depending if you're talking about Aotus trivigoratus or Aotus idiquides, <laughs> I can't pronounce those things, you're either talking about a monkey or a plant. And it's the context that gives meaning because sometimes all you get is one name and the information comes in and we've got to sort it out. With the name alone, we're going nowhere. So I've shared with you some of the challenge of names, how they're imprecise and how the context can bring meaning. Let's broaden the aperture one last time and talk about biodiversity. Now, to understand the word biodiversity, let's chop bio off and just talk about diversity. We know what diversity is about. In fact, TED is a test case for diversity. Um, I've had the privilege of meeting many of the speakers today. What, what a wacky, diverse crowd. <laughs> You guys are in for a treat because they represent so many different ideas and walks of life and uh, innovators in ways that I can't even begin to understand. And that's a good thing. Diversity makes us stronger, not weaker. Now, let's staple bio back onto the front of that. If you look out your window, you see a lot of things growing and living and interacting. You look up in the air, you see birds flying by. Where there's an absence of biodiversity, there's an absence of strength. And you can see in what's going on in the world today that as uh, ecosystems are threatened, biodiversity is threatened. And when we talk about biodiversity in the context of names, we're really talking about not just many names together, but we're talking about stories and we're talking about context. Since um, man and woman first huddled around fires uh, looking at the darkness outside and trying to make sense of the stars. They've been describing the world around them to make sense of it. They've been describing biodiversity in the context of their own lives, in the context of the lives that they saw. Looking at this drawing, you can imagine the big critter with horns probably had a name that was something like Big and Tasty. 
and the one in the middle was slightly less big and tasty, but really fast. And all those little critters were bites hard and please avoid. <laughs> but they were all things that they had in their lives and they were all part of their story. And because they knew their names and they knew their contexts, they were able to treat them with respect and they were able to um, really understand what changing one might have on another. So, names. When you add a little bit of context to names, you get a little bit of meaning. When you add a lot of context to names, you get an awful lot of meaning. So here's my wish for you. After you leave today, see something in your world that you don't know its name, something that's part of your life, the tree in your front yard, a bird that shows up every day, a vegetable that you see in a farmer's market. Know its name. Go to a place you trust. Figure out what it's called. It's not just a tomato. It's a brandywine tomato. By the way, they're really good. Um, and they're easy to grow, which is a good thing. But once you know its name, learn something about it. Learn how tall it grows, the shape of its leaf. Learn what, uh, where it goes in the wintertime. Learn what sort of soil it likes, what other plants like to grow around it. Because in learning about its name and the context in which it lives, it's now part of your story. And it's really hard to treat things whose names you know and whose stories you know with contempt. And I bet after a while you'll start to see that name popping up over and over. And as you see that name over and over and you learn something new, come tell us. Because while we're building the Encyclopedia of Life for everyone, we can't do it without you. Thank you.